one. Hi, everyone. Welcome. Uh, we're so excited to be recording this video for you today. My name is Mimi O'Hanley, and I'm the Wetlands and Water Officer at EAC. And I'm joined here today with my colleague, Nancy Anningston, the Senior Coastal Coordinator. Our presentation today is called Supporting Nova Scotia's Climate Generation, Educational Tools on Coastal Climate Change, Sea Level Rise, and the Importance of Wetlands. I want to begin today by acknowledging that we're gathering virtually on unceded and unsurrendered territory of the Mi'kmaq people. These lands are governed by peace and friendship treaties, and we are all treaty people. As we discuss important environmental issues today, we'd like to acknowledge that the Mi'kmaq people are the original stewards and knowledge holders protecting and respecting the environment. As I mentioned, Nancy and I both work at Ecology Action Center, so I just want to give you a bit of a background of what EAC is and what we do. So the EAC is a member-based environmental charity in Nova Scotia. We are the largest ENGO in Atlantic Canada and currently celebrating our 50th anniversary. We take leadership on critical environmental issues from biodiversity protection to climate change to environmental justice. We work to catalyze change through policy advocacy, community development, and building awareness. EAC is made up of seven different action teams, which you can see there on the screen. Nancy, and, Nancy works on coastal issues, and I'm part of two teams. So I work on the coastal team with Nancy, and I also work on the wilderness team. EAC is located in an award-winning, eco-renovated, century-old saltbox style home in the north end of Halifax. Our office was renovated in 2016, increasing office space by 50% and reducing energy consumption by 65%. So as of 2017, it was considered to be the most energy efficient commercial office retrofit in Canada. So today we'll be talking about three different infographics that Nancy and I have created. The first is introduction to coastal climate change in Nova Scotia. The second, importance of what uh, importance of protecting coastal ecosystems and adaptation to climate change. And finally, we'll be chatting a bit about wetlands and then give you a summary of all the EAC teaching tools that you can use in the classroom. Thanks, Mimi. So I'm going to start off the presentation today with an introduction to what uh, sort of a snapshot of what coastal climate change looks like in Nova Scotia. So we are here in Canada's ocean playground on our east coast and Nova Scotia has 13,300 kilometers of coastline. Uh, our population is just under a million people and approximately 70% of our population lives in coastal communities. We sit on the path of post-tropical storms and hurricanes, which are heading up the eastern seaboard. So we see some pretty extreme weather and probably the most notable weather events in the last several decades would be Hurricane Juan in September of 2003 and um, Hurricane Dorian in September of 2019. Uh, we also experience nor'easter storms um, and those happen typically in the winter months and um, one of the most notable um, nor'easters was uh, within six months of Hurricane Juan in February 2004 and caused a great deal of damage. In 2018, we had uh, really strong nor'easters both in January and again in March, which caused a great deal of coastal damage in the province. So we have a lot going on when it comes to extreme weather events. On our Bay of Fundy shore, we have the highest tides in the world. Um, so all of these things combined uh, put Nova Scotia uh, in a place where coastal climate change is a pretty big thing for us to be uh, dealing with and having to consider. Uh, but the icing on the cake or the exclamation mark on the sentence is we are also experiencing the worst relative sea level rise predictions in the country. Uh, and part of the reason for this is that while the sea level is rising, Nova Scotia is actually subsiding. Um, so it's a, a phenomenon called vertical land movement. Back in the day when there was a, a giant glaciers sitting in the center of the continent of North America, the coasts were all uplifting. 
And uh, as that has receded, um, the center of the continent is uplifting and unfortunately the coasts are now subsiding. So we have a small amount that we are sinking every year as those water levels are rising. And so it's really exacerbating what's happening when it comes to coastal climate change in Nova Scotia. So some of what we're seeing, and I'm going to go into these in a little more detail, in addition to those rising sea levels, so that new normal water level, and the increased frequency and intensity of weather events, and of course we already had some pretty extreme events, but now we're having more and they are worse. We're seeing storm surge and we're seeing coastal flooding. We're seeing accelerated erosion, which is different than normal erosion processes along our coastline. And now we're also starting to experience what we call salt water intrusion. So I'm just going to go into these in a bit more detail. Uh, so with rising sea levels, you experience something called inundation. So it's basically a new normal water level, which is higher than previous water levels. And where this is really impactful, and you can see from the little graphic down at the bottom there, is if your structure, your home, or your asset is sitting in a low-lying area, when that new normal water level comes into play, um, suddenly a structure which was safe previously is now flooded and being damaged by the new normal water level. Uh, when, with storm surge and coastal flooding, often we're seeing that tied with uh, extreme weather events. So an example here uh, is down in Liverpool on Nova Scotia's south shore during Hurricane Dorian. The, the downtown core experienced uh, storm surge and extreme flooding during that weather event and it caused a lot of damage. Um, so accelerated erosion is different than normal erosion, like coastlines are dynamic and they are always changing and adapting and shifting and uh, erosion is typically that you have sediment that's going away from one area, but along that same shoreline it's ending up landing in another area or accreting we call it, and that's a normal thing to be happening along a shoreline. When we, we use the term accelerated coastal erosion, we're talking about an extreme uh, loss of sediment and soil and land, um, typically happening during an extreme weather event. And the images you're looking at there are from Halifax from, uh, you know, one is from August before Hurricane Dorian in 2019, and one is the day after Dorian. And in some places that property owner lost 10 and 15 feet of land that had been there and there was a seawall and so on and just totally wiped out because of the storm. And then it's hard to see, but a new one that we're hearing more and more about is saltwater intrusion. So this is when a home is relying on a freshwater well for their domestic drinking water and, and water for use. And um, either the previous well is intruded by salt water and suddenly doesn't work anymore and they end up having to secure a tank, purchase a tank and then buy fresh water for their use as a commodity. Or in some cases now, um, people are building too close to the ocean, building new structures. And when they go to drill a well, they're unable to secure a fresh groundwater well because they're too close to the ocean. So that right from the start, they have to, uh, to purchase their water. And that's not a very sustainable way to live. And we hate to think of water as a commodity. Um, so, you know, something that we don't talk about a lot is the importance of our coastal ecosystems in terms of protecting us. So not only are our beaches and, um, you know, our coastline areas beautiful, wonderful for recreational purposes, um, there are so many other important um, aspects to them. So, you know, they're home to a whole biodiverse um, uh, range of species, and that's both on the land and in the water. Um, you know, along our shoreline, there are nurseries for commercial fish and shellfish. Um, the coastline typically acts as a uh, uh, filter for water quality and make sure that we have cleaner water, especially when you're talking about uh, salt marshes and coastal wetlands. Um, along our shoreline too, in a number of areas, carbon is actually being sequestered. So, you know, carbon that would otherwise be released as uh, greenhouse gas emissions is actually being retained in those areas, provided that they aren't disturbed. 
Um, and then uh, our shoreline actually acts as a, a way of controlling erosion or managing erosion in a reasonable level. And it, it does that a lot with natural materials, with vegetation along the coastline, holding things in place. Um, and, uh, you know, we often get calls at the Ecology Action Center from people who have just cleared all the vegetation across, off from their sandy shoreline, and now they're concerned about erosion and they want to know what we would recommend. And in fact, that vegetation, particularly really rooty, solid vegetation that will hold things in place is what you want along that shoreline to try to help slow erosion. And then our coastal ecosystems actually can serve as buffers from storms. So wave energy that's coming pounding in, wind energy, dunes will protect from wind energy, salt marshes protect and absorb that wave energy, a healthy vegetated slope on a shoreline will help buffer storm energy. So it's really important that we protect those coastal ecosystems so that they are resilient and dynamic and able to adapt in the face of coastal climate change. So, we want to make sure to convey that. And then Nova Scotia has been doing something pretty amazing since 2018. Uh, we've been working on a bill, it's called Bill 106, and it's the Coastal Protection Act. So that bill went through the legislature in the spring of 2019, and it received royal assent in April 2019. And what the Coastal Protection Act will do, that's a piece of legislation, it's going to define a coastal protection zone and uh, details, you know, we're still, we're, the act is not in force yet because it's going through the regulation stage. So this is in fall of 2021. Um, so the regulations are still being refined for how this will actually work and, and be applied. And hopefully before too much longer, the regulations will be finished and there will be some trained professionals and the act will go into force and it will stop us from building in dangerous places and destroying coastal ecosystems. And it's going to do that by defining this coastal protection zone. And if you wish to build anything within that coastal protection zone, a professional, a designated professional is going to come out and use some tools and use their expertise and do a report that goes along with your building application that shows where it is safe to build or whether or not it is safe to build in the area you want to build. So it's going to put provincial setbacks, so that's the amount you're building back from the ocean, and it's going to put the minimum vertical allowances or building elevations, I think they're calling them, uh, so the, um, the uh, level of rise, so you, know, you won't be allowed to build in a low-lying place. The concern about this uh, from a when you look at the coastline of Nova Scotia is this is wonderful and we really really need this to stop us from building in dangerous places now but this only applies to future development once the act goes into force so the problem is we are a 13,300 kilometer coastline filled with structures that are and assets that are currently at risk from coastal climate change and so this won't help with those what we have to do from an adaptation standpoint when it comes to those structures that are currently at risk is we need to find ways to adapt the structures. So in some cases that can be the sander accommodate on this slide. Uh, you can sometimes elevate a structure and then it becomes more safe when sea level is rising. Um, the Coastal Protection Act falls under the avoid um, adaptation option. So let's stop building in, in new places, but that's you know for future development only. Um, protect is an interesting one. You know, there's sort of an old logic where we're trying to build seawalls and rock walls and what we call hard armored structures. Um, and there's a temptation to do that, to try to protect structures that are at, at risk. But unfortunately, when we build the hard armored structures, we absolutely stop our coastal ecosystems from being able to adapt. They're no longer dynamic and able to respond and change. And they end up, uh, you know, there's scour and sediment is lost and the wave energy is still pounding against the wall. And sometimes we see collapse of the earth behind the wall. And, um, and then on the protect sort of 
continuum, there are hard armoring options, but there are also hybrid options where you're combining, let's use some rock, but we'll use some natural infrastructure, nature-based solutions, green solutions. Um, and then on the far end of the continuum is um, soft or green or nature-based armoring. And with those, we're typically talking about things like living shorelines, you're using vegetation, you're using natural woody materials and, you know, enhancing the soil, bringing more soil in and sometimes incorporating some rock and so on, but it's not making a hard seawall that stops that coastal ecosystem from being able to adapt and change. So, Different solutions work in different areas. If it's really high wave energy, a soft solution may not be as effective. Um, so there are lots of different options and um, lots of interesting information uh, as you look at across that continuum from soft to hard armoring. And then retreat is another option, but retreat is very specific. It, your structure has to be able to be moved and you have to have property uh, you know, on your location to be able to move back. So it's helpful when you have a great big piece of land and the structure is close to the water's edge, but you have lots of land that you can move towards the road um, and your structure can be lifted and moved. There is some, of course, some expense attached to that and not all structures can be moved. Unfortunately, what often happens is when there's been accelerated erosion or when someone has built a structure too close to the ocean, oftentimes the road is right behind them and they don't have the luxury of being able to move. So retreat is not always an option. We don't see it happening a lot, but it is certainly for some folks an option they can use to adapt in the face of coastal climate change. Um, and now I'm going to turn it over to Mimi. Thanks, Nancy. Yeah, so I'm going to chat a little bit about wetlands. Uh, they're incredible natural features that are found throughout Nova Scotia and really around the world. And I get really excited about them. But unfortunately, the narrative around wetlands can often illustrate them as wastelands or something that humans aren't too fond of. Um, and I think it's important to understand why this is. Sometimes people associate wetlands with bugs, uh, especially mosquitoes. If you're walking through a swampy or wet area when you're hiking or when you're just outside, this can be unenjoyable for some and you might be walking through a wetland. You could just be walking through a wet area as well. Uh, humans have used and continue to use wetlands as a place to dump wastewater. And this is kind of a vicious cycle because the more folks dump wastewater into wetlands, the more they believe they are wastelands. And the more that they believe that they're wastelands, the more they feel it's okay to dump wastewater into them. Wetlands aren't always the prettiest to look at. So the image I have there is obviously beautiful. That's the salt marsh trail in Dartmouth. Um, but not all wetlands look like that. And humans tend to really like aesthetically pleasing things and wetlands don't always follow under that. Uh, and the utility of wetlands is not always visible or obvious to humans. So especially when compared to things like rivers or lakes, um, it's not always clear what the use of wetlands are and how they might benefit to how they might benefit humans. And kind of going off that, often conversations around freshwater protection is around lakes and rivers, and there's less of a focus or awareness on wetlands. And I think it's really important to understand how wetlands can often be viewed in the broader society and the bad or unfortunate reputations that wetlands can have. Because uh, I think it highlights a major issue with wetlands, it, that there's a large public unawareness of them and how incredible they are. So this, this lack of public unawareness was a huge driver in the creation of the infographic that Nancy and I developed. The more that we learned about wetlands and what amazing natural features they are and why they're so crucial to protect, especially as the impacts of climate change intensify, the more we knew we wanted to share this with everyone. So wetlands are natural features that we should be getting really excited about because uh, it's truly amazing how much wetlands do for humans, how much they do for wildlife, for the earth, and for mitigating and adapting to climate change. So while Nancy and I did lead the creation of this infographic, we also had several other contributors share their expertise on wetlands as well. So this, these contributors include um, another member of the wilderness team at EAC, a wetland staff member at Ducks Unlimited Canada, a wetland specialist and professor at St. Mary's University, 
and a Mi'kmaq wetland researcher in Cape Breton. So I wanna begin with starting with the basic understanding of what a wetland is, because not everyone knows, but also definitions can change depending on who you're talking to and where in the world they're located. So for this presentation, we're using the definition that wetlands are low-lying areas of land where fresh or salt water gathers. Wetlands may be quite small or span across very large areas. Wetlands hold standing or very slow moving water and can be wet or dry depending on the season. And this last bit of information may come as a surprise, um, but wetlands can dry up during certain seasons, but that doesn't mean that they're not a wetland. So there are many different types of wetlands in Nova Scotia. Uh, Nancy, do you mind just going to the next slide? So you may be familiar with swamps, bogs and marshes, but there are also fens, vernal pools and coastal lagoons. Mangroves are also a really popular type of wetland that you might've heard of, um, but these are generally found in tropical areas of the world. So each of these different types of wetlands functions somewhat differently and supports a unique array of plant and wildlife. So Nova Scotia is rich in wetlands. Based on the most recent inventory, Nova Scotia is comprised of almost 7% freshwater wetlands and salt marsh. So over three quarters of this are peatlands. So that includes bogs and fens. Um, and these are famous around the world for their size. And then the, most, the next two most common types of wetlands in Nova Scotia are shrub swamps and then salt marshes. So I'm gonna chat a little bit about the benefits of wetlands. Nancy, do you mind just going to the next slide? Awesome. Uh, so this kind of goes off of what Nancy was saying in her part of the presentation, but coastal wetlands protect communities from coastal climate change by buffering storms through absorbing damaging wave energy. This is particularly important when hurricanes or severe storms come ashore. So while most of the benefits that I'm chatting about today can be applicable in communities across Canada, this one is particularly relevant here in Nova Scotia, given that the province has such an extensive coastline and because we do experience more intense impacts of storms and hurricanes compared to some other areas of Canada. Um, in a recent publication on the International Guidelines on Nature-Based Features, they highlighted that during Hurricane Sandy, states that had more wetlands actually experienced a 30% reduction in damages. So that's huge, that's quite significant um, and really exemplifies how much wetlands do to protect our communities during these storms. Next slide, Nancy. Uh, wetlands also act as natural sponges because uh, they absorb rainfall and allow groundwater to replenish and this reduces flood impact. So just to give you a little bit of an idea of how much water wetlands can hold, a one acre wetland that's one foot deep can hold about 1.25 million liters of water. So that's huge. If that wetland isn't there, that water all has to go somewhere else. Um, and this is particularly important because Nova Scotia is a very rainy province and we're gonna experience more rain as climate change intensifies. So wetlands are gonna become even more crucial. Wetlands are also critical for biodiversity. Wetlands are homes to home to thousands of species. Uh, they're essential for many amphibians, including some of Nova Scotia's at-risk species, such as the Blanding turtle. Also other at-risk species, such as the mainland moose, also use wetlands. And they're really important for bird breeding and migration. Next slide, please. So wetlands also provide water purification by trapping sediment and absorption, absorption by wetland plant roots and microorganisms in the soil. So this filtration process can remove many unwanted nutrients and pollutants and improve water quality. So in terms of sediment, wetlands can reduce up to 90%. So that's quite significant. Um, and as water from a stream channel or runoff enters a wetland, the water spreads out and flows through the dense vegetation uh, because the velocity is quite low, uh, the, the suspended material then settles to the bottom. Also things like nitrogen and phosphorus, which may be from things like agriculture, lawn fertilizer, pet waste, sewer and septic systems. Um, these can all produce toxic chemicals and choke out natural vegetation and wildlife. So this is where we see things like really dangerous algae blooms in the summer, which I will talk about a little bit later, but Oat Hill Lake was um, an area that really suffered from these algae blooms at one point. Um, but when, 
these materials enter wetlands first, the wetlands can actually purify that water and make it less harmful. So by the time it enters a lake or a river, those algae blooms are less likely to happen. But of course, there is a limit to how much a natural wetland can take. So that's not to say that we should be dumping all of our lawn fertilizers or agricultural waste into wetlands because they do have a, a limit. The high storage capacity of wetlands also helps to safeguard against dry seasons and droughts. So this is a continuation of wetlands being natural sponges because they store that water and save it. So it can be really beneficial during dry times. And next slide, please, Nancy. So wetlands offer, offer space for recreation, uh, food harvesting and community well-being. So wetlands are really awesome to have adventures in. You can hike in them, gather, gather edible and medicinal plants, uh, and you can also fish and hunt in wetlands. And wetlands store carbon and mitigate climate change through reducing released greenhouse gas emissions. So Nancy talked a little bit about this as well. Um, and while forests are arguably the most well-known natural carbon sequesters, uh, Per square meter, some salt or some uh, wetlands, particularly salt marshes, can actually sequester significantly more carbon. So one reason is that these ecosystems accumulate carbon so effectively is that they're waterlogged, they're dark, and they're very productive. Um, and they store carbon in the vegetation above ground and also underground in both the live plants and the dead plants. So things like leaf litter. Um, next slide, please. Wetlands are important places used by the Mi'kmaq peoples for hunting, trapping, fishing, harvesting shellfish, and gathering traditionally used medicine, medicinal plants. Uh, they are considered important overwintering areas for eels, which are a source of food, skins, and medicines for the Mi'kmaq all year. And also just to put a bit of a price tag on wetlands, a GPI Atlantic study says that wetlands provide an estimated $7.9 billion worth of benefits to Nova Scotians annually. So that's almost $8 billion. That's quite significant. Um, but despite all of these amazing benefits, the world has lost quite a bit of its global wetlands. Just next slide, Nancy. So it's estimated that 85% of the world's wetlands have been lost since 1700. 64% of the world's wetlands have been lost since 1900, a significant amount of wetlands around the Bay of Fundy have been lost in the last few hundred years. Um, and then if you look at some parts of Nova Scotia, I'm thinking specifically about the Halifax Peninsula, almost all wetlands have disappeared. There's a couple in the various parks around the city, but basically all of the wetlands are gone. And why is this? What are the top threats to uh, wetlands? Infilling of wetlands for development, this could be for residential, industrial, or infrastructure projects, and the conversion of wetlands for economic development, that's probably the biggest threat. Um, again, because the value of wetlands haven't always been prioritized, especially when compared to economic development, and people aren't always concerned with the infill of wetlands. Um, and I mentioned before that wetlands can be amazing at sequestering carbon, but poorly managed wetlands uh, can often be sources of carbon when they're developed, drained, or enroached upon by development. So if wetlands are functioning naturally, of course, they're going to sequester that carbon. But as soon as you develop it, all of that carbon is released into the atmosphere. So they go from being mitigators of climate change to contributors to climate change. Um, and of course, the destruction of wetlands can have many direct impacts, but also the infilling of wetlands can have many significant indirect impacts as well. So a few slides before I show the image of Oat Hill Lake that's in Dartmouth. Um, this is a lake that up until a few years ago was quite sick. It was basically a, a dead lake. There was hardly any biodiversity. There was a lot of, um, it experienced a lot of, a lot of anoxic conditions. Uh, there were a lot of different algae blooms. People couldn't really swim in, any, in it anymore. It was quite dangerous to swim in. Um, and if you go back to the history of Oat Hill Lake, there's no surprise that once you see the disappearance of the wetlands in the surrounding area, that's when Oat Hill Lake starts to experience these different problems. Um, now there is an aerator in Oat Hill Lake that was um, implemented by a group of really caring citizens. So Oat Hill Lake is basically on life support and it can't function naturally, but it 
this example really does highlight the importance of wetlands to other natural features. Other threats include climate change, habitat shifting, and changes to the hydrological cycle, um, excessive runoff of pollutants from agriculture, fertilizers, and nutrients, household sewage, leaking septic tanks, and urban wastewater. So again, that goes back to wetlands have their own natural capacity and can't take an abundance of these um, runoff. Uh, reckless ATV use uh, can also wreak havoc on wetlands. Invasive non-native species, so something like Japanese knotweed, which we see a lot in Nova Scotia. Poor, poor stormwater management and roads and driveways. So what are the consequences of wetland destruction? So next slide, please. Thank you, Nancy. So we need to protect our wetlands to avoid reduction of water supply, reduced water quality, loss of co coastal climate change buffering, and loss of biodiversity. When we destroy wetlands, we can also be faced with an increased abundance of weeds and mosquito issues. So this goes back to what I said at the beginning is that a lot of people associate wetlands with mosquitoes, but it's actually when we take those wetlands away um, that we get an even bigger mosquito Edo problem, an increased risk and severity of algae blooms, loss of important protection during severe storms, and an increase of both floods and droughts. So protecting wetlands protects us. Next slide, please, Nancy. So I just wanted to plug that every February 2nd is World Wetlands Day. So this year, uh, or in 2022, it will be on Wednesday. Um, and I just added a couple of additional resources that you can use either for yourself or for your class. So that first one is the World Wetlands Day website. So you can look at wetlands on a global scale, see some of the events that are happening around the world. Um, I also put in the Ducks Unlimited website there. They have some really great videos and images about Canadian wetlands. And it's a really great way to celebrate all the wetlands we have here. And that last one is uh, the Treasured Wetlands of Nova Scotia website. So every year, a number of wetlands gets named to be the Treasured Wetlands. It's a great way to celebrate the local wetlands in Nova Scotia. So you can even look and see where the Treasured Wetlands near you are, and you can even go out and see them and, and learn all about their great features. All right, and so just in closing our presentation today, we wanted to bring your attention to a couple of different infographics that the coastal team has created and an infographic that the wilderness and coastal team have created. Um, so the ones you're looking at right now on the slide are um, there's on the right hand side, there's a broad coastal climate change in Nova Scotia that gives you an overview of some of the things that we're experiencing and why we are experiencing them and what the situation is like here in Nova Scotia. And then on the left hand side, there's a very detailed um, infographic specifically focused on sea level rise in Atlantic Canada. Um, and you'll find uh, when you look at that resource or if you just do a, a search online, our Ecology Action Center has created a website and the URL is www.clevelrise, all spelled out, .ca. And that website is a fantastic resource that contains all kinds of information. There are videos, there's community discussion toolkits, reports, um, all kinds of tools that you can use to find information about sea level rise. And there's also an infographic for British Columbia as well, a similar sea level rise for British Columbia infographic. Those the infographics on the sea level rise website are bilingual as well. So you're uh, able to look at them both in English and in French. And um, so it's a really useful resource and we would happily encourage you to print those off, to access the website and to use those um, however you find helpful. We really want uh, the public to understand what's happening with coastal climate change in the province. And um, so we really encourage you to use them. And then I'm gonna move forward for Mimi here. Thanks, Nancy. Yeah, so this is the wetlands infographic that Nancy and I created. Um, just like the other two infographics that Nancy showed, we really encourage you to use them, use them in your classrooms, use them for personal use, share them. Uh, they're a great resource and they really highlight the, the amazing features of wetlands and also the threats that um, are, are causing their destruction. 
Wonderful. And now uh, we would both like to say thank you so much for watching this video. We've put some links here for those resources and we really want you to have a great understanding of these topics and uh, we're hoping that you'll be able to motivate all kinds of citizens to, to get involved and to help protect our coastal ecosystems and our wetlands. And so I will say thank you and turn over to Mimi. Yeah, thank you so much. I hope you enjoyed learning all about the different features of coastal climate change, sea level rise, and wetlands. Have a great day.